This is Movie Tone. Lionel Gamlin reporting. Far cry to 1900, 50 years of crowded history since that last year of Queen Victoria's reign. She died in 1901, and all the kings and emperors of that time rode in her funeral procession, for there were many kings and emperors in those days. The Edwardian era, now regarded as the peak period of English magnificence. Women wore sumptuous and concealing clothes in this last stage of their political inferiority to men. Fashion was beginning to ring the changes more frequently, and the hostesses of Edwardian society set the standards. Over this legendary period presided the genial king who entertained shooting house parties at Sandringham and contributed a personal share to the country's foreign policy by promoting the Entente Cordiale with France. Did I mention women's emancipation? The suffragette movement was afoot. Militant ladies were willing to go to jail, picket the House of Commons, chain themselves to railings in order to secure the vote from which all the other equalities have flowed. And that's less than 50 years ago. Think of it. And then the first great calamity burst upon us. We called it the Great War because we never imagined there could be a greater. King George V was on the throne then. Bosch and Haig were the two Allied commanders. Poincaré, the French president, on the left. David Lloyd George, the prime minister who saw it through to victory. And in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, the Allies imposed peace on Germany. The first 30 years of our period saw tremendous developments. To take the first and obvious one, the cinema. Middle-aged members of my audience will remember this sort of thing. But in 1928, films began to talk, and in 1929, British Movie Tone News produced the first British, British newsreel in sound. News presents to you, in natural sound and graphic action, the current events of the world. I introduce to you the uh, members of the cabinet who have been chosen for very hard work, and because I believe the nation fully believes that they are perfectly competent to perform. Yes, in our second issue, Mr. Ramsay MacDonald introduced the members of his cabinet, for there was a Labour government in 1929. The spread of socialism and the attainment of office by the Labour Party was the second great political development of the half century, the women's vote being the first. Internationally, the League of Nations was in full career, though weakened by the abstention of America. The increasing wealth and influence of the United States was one of the marks of the period. Huge skyscrapers multiplied in New York, business boomed, Vast fortunes were made on Wall Street. Then came a crash. Beginning in 1929 on Wall Street, a terrible slump hit America. It continued through 1930, and in 1931, to forestall a run on the banks, they were closed. In 1933, when the slump had about finished its course, Franklin D. Roosevelt, one of the great figures of the half century, came into office with his New Deal. Does it all seem a long time ago? Is the jubilee of King George V now ancient history? In 1935, the king celebrated 25 years of eventful reign. In 1936, he died and was buried at Windsor amid scenes of universal sorrow.
There followed the short reign of Edward VIII and the abdication crisis. The monarchy survived the shock, for it was a shock and threatened to divide the nation. And our present king and queen, who were crowned at Westminster in May 1937, so healed the breach as to make the apprehensions of that time now seem remote and fantastic. Remember him? The name was Mussolini, and he started something. He founded a totalitarianism of the right, which he called fascism. He dreamt of building a new Roman Empire, so he went to war with Abyssinia. Mussolini succeeded in annexing Abyssinia and in killing faith in the League of Nations, but his chief accomplishment was in showing the way to another dictator. It's not difficult to remember him. Hitler must surely go down in modern history as its biggest object lesson, for 1939 could have been prevented in 1935 when he was allowed to reoccupy the Rhineland. Munich, where Britain and France purchased a little time by appeasement, time which did enable Britain to develop her hurricanes and spitfires. Mr. Chamberlain did what he could and at least ensured that Britain went into the Second World War having done everything possible to preserve peace. Memories of the Second World War remain so vivid they don't require much stirring. They'll always be associated in our minds with Dunkirk, the Battle of Britain pilots, the Blitz. The convoys. The Western Desert. Normandy. With Monte. And with Winston Churchill. But don't let us forget that Hitler had his moments too, and that the defeat of Nazism, the totalitarianism of the right, was a near thing. It was only accomplished by the maximum efforts of the three great powers and their allies. When the Western powers were celebrating victory, how could they foresee that their ally, the Soviet, would so quickly separate from them and carry differences to the point of Cold War? It's been the task of Mr. Attlee's Labour government, elected in 1945, to deal with these foreign problems. The first Labour government with an overall majority in the House of Commons, they've at last secured the power to put in operation the policies of socialism. Nationalisation has posed many new problems with which the second half of the century will have to grapple. But the chief national problem of all is that of paying for our imports. A rich nation in 1900, Britain in 1950 is impoverished. The general election may bring in the Conservatives, or it may confirm the Socialists in power, but somehow by 1952, when America's generous help is due to cease, Britain must discover the way to make ends meet. Over the whole future broods the menace of the atom bomb, and it may be that civilization, having defeated the totalitarianism of the right, will be plunged into a desperate conflict with the same forces coming from the left. But moderate people will take heart from the one proud achievement of 1949, the success of the airlift. Strength, resourcefulness and perseverance enable the Western powers to beat the blackmail of the Russians and keep Berlin supplied until the blockade was called off. These pictures of the aircraft regularly flying their loads into the heart of Berlin may provide us with the symbol of hope for the next 50 years. Typified by the comet, let aviation stand for all the other great advances which the past 50 years can show. The united wisdom of mankind, having achieved these wonders and organized their routine functioning, will surely contrive the means whereby the United Nations of the world may live in peace to enjoy them.